Alrighty, I think we're live for the next episode. Today I'm joined by uh, Associate Professor Jacoa Bragash here at the University of Houston, who's actually right down the hallway from my research group, but in completely different worlds. I'm excited to have him on today because um, for the viewers that are listening today that aren't exactly chemists, I will kind of be along for the ride today because I quite literally have no idea um, what the... Uh, well, I've talked to... Uh, you know, Roy and, and uh, Roy, uh, Jacob and Shruti, and they explain the research well, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite outside of my area of expertise. So I will be along for the ride today and I'm excited to learn to hear, you know, from, from their, from their advisor. So, you know, welcome, welcome on professor. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to have you on today. Yeah. Thank thanks, thanks for, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's always fun to, to get to, uh, sort of talk to, to different audiences and, kind of convey the, the cool work that we're doing in my lab, which is by its very nature chemistry, but often a chemistry that falls between the cracks. Uh, you know, the ideas of, of solid state chemistry, you know, we're, we're chemists by training, but you know, we kind of occupy a world of material science and condensed matter physics, um, thinking about how, how chemical bonds influence things that we use in our everyday life. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting too because you have you also have a very I would say diverse area of research too. It's not you really kind of are stretched um, in a broad areas. So it's I'm a, I'm a, I'm a excited to attack kind of almost all of them today, and we'll we'll kind yeah. of dissect them a, a little bit all today. But first, you know, definitely want to start with a little bit about you, just so like some you know people can get to know you a little bit. I know you did your um, you know PhD at Iowa State, um, got your degree from there, but you know. Um, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about your background. People can yeah, learn a little bit, learn sure, a little sure. bit about you. So, so my, my, uh, starting with my undergraduate, I went to Illinois State, uh, where I worked with a guy named David Cedeno as an as undergrad researcher. Um, and he was really interested in, in sort of spectroscopic characterization of, of uh, molecules. So I worked on porphyrins for photodynamic therapy, understanding the photophysical properties and, and trying to figure out how we can take these molecules and, and get uh, singlet oxygen uh, generation that could be used for, for PDT. So that was actually a, a kind of a cool project because uh, David worked closely with an organic chemist named uh, Tim Lash, who's a, a porphyrin guy. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, really sort of the feedback that, that our work gave in terms of what types of, of chemical substituents we would need in order to maximize singlet oxygen generation uh, could be, you know, synthesized just, just one floor above. So that was kind of a, a cool project, but I knew that I wanted to get a little bit more applied. Uh, and so when I went to uh, Iowa State, I'd actually uh, intended to work for a, a guy named Victor Lin, who is a mesoporous uh, carbon uh, professor. And so when I when I showed up in Ames, I kind of met with with the different faculty members, and and uh, you know I was sort of really intrigued by the work that that Gordy Miller was doing. Uh, he's a solid state chemist by, by training, but was sort of unique. And this would have been in, in, uh, 2008 was that his group did both computation and, and experiment. And in the molecular world in 2008, that was not common. It was becoming more common, you know, right. programs like Gaussian were becoming available in, in 2008, which is kind of funny to think, cause really not all that long ago, um, yeah. but it really, you know, it was sort of like at, at the forefront, but in the solid state world, it was, was still fairly un, unheard of. Mm -hmm. And so I was was really in, enjoying this idea, and I decided that that I would give give it a shot to work with with Gordy in summer research, and and I really enjoyed it. It was something that that I never thought I would do, but it turned out to be the the perfect thing. Now, how me. how did you get into like I would say, well, how, first of all, how did you even get into chemistry, right? So like, and then also the second question to that is, um, you know, why go to Iowa State? Um, yeah, up there in Ames, so. If yeah, on those I, two. man, I don't know how I got into to, to chemistry. Honestly, I think it was in high school. I took AP Chem and I was pretty good at it. Right. Fair and enough. when I would, yeah, and when I took, you know, I think a lot of it was then I would go and talk to friends mm -hmm. or you know, uh, uh, say friends' parents in high school, and they'd ask what classes I was taking, and like, oh, I was in AP Chem, and they yeah. would just be like, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> like, I can't do chemistry, and I was like, oh. Okay, well, I can do this. I yeah. probably so it's not that hard. Yeah. Um, so that's how I, I think I got into uh, into chemistry. Was really I think the, there was positive f 
feedback in a way that that like oh I could do this I was I was good at it um and then I just sort of sort of stuck stuck with it you know it was looking looking back it was a a lot of sort of decision points that I was not particularly aware of at the time like I when I graduated I was was looking for jobs and this would have been in 2008 and mm. you know I wasn't really finding any any jobs to be honest most of my friends didn't graduate also in in four years of college and so they were still hanging out and so I was like well you know maybe I'll just go to go to graduate school that seems like a good idea looking yeah. back now of course I wasn't finding a job it was the beginning and the height of the financial crisis right I'm I'm a millennial <laughs> that had this this sort of challenge coming right out of right out of college that is a so it worked, it, in challenge. that way it, yeah and and so in yeah. that way it worked out for for the best because I got into graduate school and I learned very quickly that it was something that I excelled at in terms of of thinking about science which is really what the PhD is teaching you it's not necessary it's teaching you some hands-on skills but a PhD right. is really teaching you about how to think about science what's the scientific process right right so, yeah that's yeah I that did seem like a natural progression, right? If you have the 2008 house, housing crisis and job yeah. crisis, like I just, well, I guess we're going to graduate school. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> what a, yeah. I mean, was that like, I mean, was that scary? Like in the, in the moment, like what, like what was like, was no, it kind I of didn't just, even realize it. Yeah. I, didn't, I honestly didn't even realize it until <laughs> more recently with, you know, sort of the, the, the questionable, uh, uh, in uh, economy today, you know, are we in a recession or are we not in a recession? People are sort of, saying, oh, well, in 2008, and I was like, wait a minute, was I affected by that? Didn't even, didn't even realize it. I guess the <laughs> ignorance is, is bliss at, at that point. Um, yeah. At least coming out of college, I was just like, yeah, this is, yeah. this is cool. Now, how about, so why, so then why like Iowa State then? It seems like, to me, it seems a bit random, but like, I, I yeah, I well, I, I mean, from, program. from, from Illinois, it's, it's a little bit, uh, less okay. random. Um, that makes sense. So I, I, I applied a, across across the country. Um, but what I was really looking for was inorganic chemistry. I'll say that. So I, I did want to switch from from sort of a physical chemistry to a more uh, inorganic and materials chemistry. And mm -hmm. Iowa State has among uh, sort of the most notable materials chemistry with an emphasis on chemistry um, in, in the US, you know, they had okay. had a, a really long line stemming from the fact that Ames National Lab is there. So okay. um, Ames Lab was part of uh, or an outcrop of the Manhattan Project. And so in Ames and, and still to this day, uh, they they have some of the best rare earth purification processes in existence. And so um, knowing that I wanted to do inorganic materials, to be honest, not knowing I wanted to do solid state, which it turns out Iowa State is among the best right. historically for that. Uh, is it, it worked out right? So it's kind of a um, you know I, I lucked into that decision a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was it was a, a good program. It was uh, or it is a it is a good program. It's a great program for exactly what I ended up uh, mm -hmm. ended up doing. Uh, the winters were cold. You know, it's a They're bit friendly. windy and a bit a bit cold there. But yeah. again, you know, it's I'm in Houston now, so it's just polar polar opposite. Yeah, due, right. Do south, do south, and inverse seasons. So I was okay. gonna say, like, yeah, I, I, winters are nice here, but man, the summers are brutal. It's like 105. It's, luckily, it's, luckily, SCL is pretty SCL is pretty good about air, air conditioning, but man, it's pretty brutal outside. Um, the heat is turning on today. Right. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Um, <laughs> just on just on the names National Laboratory. Yeah. Like, do you know the origin of what? So after the Manhattan Project, like, do you happen to know why people moved to Ames? Like, I just that also just seems super random. Like, was that always um, there? Oh, so 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 the town I'm sure today is the size it is because uh, it was uh, because of the university. Mm. Um, so as far as I know, I'd have to double check, but I'm pretty sure that Iowa State is a what's called a land grant university. Okay, you know, and so so lands were sort of set aside for for educational development and there's a lot of land-grant universities particularly in the upper midwest and these are schools that you would you would know of uh urbana champaign i believe was right. a land grant university so across the board so so there was a lot of these that that were started and mm. then the town grew up around them so 
one of the nice things, especially as a, a graduate student, was was summers in Ames because you know your population of the city is probably you know fifty thousand uh, plus or minus, and they thirty thousand of those were students. Yay. So when the undergraduates would leave, it was <laughs> fantastic. It that was does fantastic, sound like really fun. and you don't get that in, in Houston. Campus gets yeah. gets quiet, but whether campus, or not, yeah. campus, yeah, yeah, whether it's or not hard the to students enjoy the, around, yeah, yeah, it's hard to enjoy the weather in Houston outside even when the students aren't around. Um, yeah, not to say the undergrads are bad, but like there definitely is a there definitely is something to be said about being with other working professionals. You know, it makes it nice to go grab a coffee on yeah. a on a on a quiet yeah. day when you're not yes. standing in line. Yes. Uh, what so yeah? What were some of the things to do up there and uh, up there in uh, Iowa State? Like, what were some of the things you did outside of the chemistry classroom, or like when you're taking classes and research? I was a graduate student. I worked. What do you mean? Well, what else was there to do? <laughs> yeah, you know we, what? I take that back. I take back what I said. My life is only consumed <laughs> in the lab. Nine. There hours you a day. go. There you I, go. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> we uh. So we had a, we. I had a fantastic graduate graduate cohort. So it's funny. When, again, when you sort of get through it and pass it, you're going to find that you have two cohorts of friends. You have your friends from your undergraduate life and you have your friends from your graduate life. And, yeah. and you know, these two often don't mix because or mix as much just because, you know, the, the experiences are very, very different. Very different. Yeah. Um, but my graduate, my graduate friend group, uh, you know, we've all gone to do very cool things working at, at industry, uh, academia, um, and, and, you know, at the time we, we would go golfing in the summer. Um, Iowa had a, a bunch of sort of uh, river floats that you could go on. So we would do these these types of, of things. But often it was, you know, it, it's hard to say that that we uh, we worked all the time because we certainly didn't. But it was a work. It was certainly a work hard, play hard in, environment. Right. We were there to, to do what we had to do um, in terms of research. And Ames is a, a great place for that because there's not a tremendous amount of distraction. Right. Uh, you know, you're not going to, to concerts every weekend like you could do here in here in the city. No, no professional sporting uh, events can't just pop into a <laughs> pro soccer or, or Astros game. Yeah. Um, but it also, you know, it's uh, so you, you can kind of focus a little bit and, and work. But it's right. it's a great and it's a great environment. I, uh, I noticed that sure. generally for the grad student life, like it's really in the little moments in the, in the lab, like seeing your lab mates, like it's in those little interactions, the day to day that really kind of, that really do shine that you don't really think about, especially when you apply for graduate school. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, a lot of it, a lot of it can be luck, but you know, if your cohort's good, you know, the, the, the then mm -hmm. the day to day is not monotonous and laborious. That's right. Actually it's right. very good. So it definitely That's is right. a, a good point. Um, so in your, during graduate school, you know, what did you work on? And also too, um, you know, were there, obviously you had moments where things weren't working. So was there a, what do you like, remember the moment where you finally got some of the work and it finally went your way and then it kind of flipped your, your perspective on the grad life? Yeah. So, so what I worked on, um, so yes, yeah, so I went in and, and, and Gordy's, uh, group really is, was about sort of computational design of, of solid state compounds, as I said, kind of at a time when this was, was really coming out. And my focus was on, uh, a fundamental understanding of magnetism in boron rich metals. So, uh, today these are, are, as I kind of said, in, in, uh, highlight of my background, a lot of what, what we do in my group is focused on materials that you touch in your everyday life, whether or not you realize it. Right. So, um, Magnetic borides are used in virtually every speaker, every microphone. Um, you know, there's hundreds of, of uh, uh, boride magnets in, in your car, your microphone. Right now you're talking through the headphones I'm listening, the mm. speakers on your computers, everything have these, these uh, hard magnets. One of the, the issues with them is that they are uh, really rare earth rich. So they contain neodymium and, and dysprosium in particular. And, you know, you, you hear about all of these, you know, rare earth challenges, right? Rare, rare earths are um, an interesting series of elements because they have a tremendous amount of application across, you know, everything from catalysis to uh, mm -hmm. sort of electronic applications. Um, they aren't all that particularly rare, though. They're not, they're not the rarest. They're not like your, your, uh, you know, iridiums and, and uh, rhodiums, right. but they are, you know, partly 
unfortunately geopolitically located from a U.S. perspective. Yeah. And worse, they're very, very toxic. Well, not toxic, but they're very costly to to, to purify. Right? Okay. Lots of lots of nasty waste. Um, that in the in the U.S., you know, we're just not having giant pools of nitric acid necessarily sort of out there that are are part of the waste stream. And so uh, there's a huge push, and in, in, uh, today Ames Lab has a huge effort in in sort of shifting the rare earths. Uh, to other elements that are, right. are not as as uh, risky. Mm. So my focus was on thinking about how can we use computation to to design some of these these materials. Um, but largely at the time, it was not even how do we design them, but how do we just understand what's what's happening. Mm. And so that involved doing computation to, to calculate what is the magnetic structure of these compounds look like, uh, and then using synthesis, making the materials that we were calculating, going into lab and saying, all right, what we predict is, is what we're what we're actually seeing. So I don't, I don't really have any examples that that come to mind of days where it was just like, oh, this is this is working. It was a lot of, you know, the the project just is like I think like a natural majority of projects just a just a natural progression, and to be honest, a, a slog, you know, in a in a good way. Like the 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 PhD is certainly I think the best example you can imagine of a marathon and not a sprint, right? Yeah. Because it is it's two step forwards one step back on a daily basis and the best students and and i you know i sort of think about this when i look for for students who want to join my group the best students are the resilient students the ones who can take that inevitable failure and still show up the next day right that's something that i think is is an under appreciated trait of a phd student something we don't often realize that when you have a prospect of 75% failure on any given day, <laughs> it takes a lot to still show up. It yeah. takes a lot to still show up. Um, and so that's, yeah, so I, I, nothing comes to mind. I, you know, maybe I've, I've just, or I've just, I've blacked those memories, maybe uh, those painful memories out <laughs> of, of the failure that, that never went anywhere. And that, you know, fair enough, fair enough, you know, um, so, okay, so after your PhD at uh, Iowa State, you then did a, a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara. Um, yeah. But so was then, well, a natural question is, you know, was the, was a natural progression into the postdoc, like, was that also natural too? You weren't, maybe you're not ready to go to industry or did you know at the time you like you wanted to be a professor? Like, you know, how did that all transpire? <laughs> I started graduate school and I said I would never, never become a professor. Well. Uh, <laughs> I actually, in graduate school, um, I started uh, a local chapter of the American Chemical Society's Younger Chemist Committee. So okay. uh, if you are a young chemist, meaning in, in uh, basically under the age of, of 35, but largely it's graduates, graduate students and postdocs, um, it's a fantastic community to get in, get involved with. It sort of bridges and brings the ACS, which people often, I think, assume the, you know, the ACS is, is a you know, this big behemoth that puts on conferences and that's about all it's good for. Uh, but the, they do bring a lot of, of support in, in ways that you may not realize. The Younger Chemist Committee is a way to bridge that and, and sort of teach the young folks about. Is the there ACS. one here at Houston? Uh, I believe there, there is, there is a greater Houston chapter. It's not particularly centered at U of H as okay. far as I recall. So okay. it's, you know, the, the, Houston's a funny place for chemistry because it's such a big endeavor, right? In Ames, chemistry is the university and, you know, a couple uh, startups that come out of it and small companies nearby. In Houston, <laughs> psh, we are utterly irrelevant, which yeah. is a great, great thing. Uh, you know, you can look out the window of the, the fourth floor here and, and see real chemistry at work uh, on a daily basis. And Regina um, So I started, yeah, so, so I start. yeah, that's right. So I started a, a younger chemist uh, committee largely to be like, all right, let's bring in some industry speakers. Let's bring in people uh, from the region who can teach us about something more than academia. Again, now today, this is becoming more well known. And, and you know, 2008, it was kind of, you know, people talked about, uh, you know, beyond academia um, jobs, but not not like they do today. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, so I did that and I was like, yeah, this is this is great. But I'll say that while I was in graduate school interacting with uh, my advisor, Gordy, he was tremendously supportive. He was, you know, patient, taught me about science. I, I learned a lot about how do we 
think about science? How do we mentor undergraduates? He gave me a lot of opportunities to sort of, you know, be independent and work with students and guide the project on my own that started to set me up for thinking about being a faculty member. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is not that, that bad of a, a gig to be honest, probably blissfully uh, ignorant to the fact of how hard it is to get a, an R1 faculty job. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think that that's, that's, uh, it is, it is challenging, but I think that that's, that's okay also because at the end of the day it is hard. And I think if you have your heart dead set on doing it, that's, you know, the expectation that is when you you can get your heart broken. I said, yeah, this is cool. I, I would enjoy doing this. Let me, let me put myself on that path. And if it works out great, and if not, that's okay. That's okay too. Um, so I went to, uh, to UC Santa Barbara to the materials research lab uh, to work with a guy named Ram Shashadri, largely because I wanted to become a little bit more applied. As I said, you know, at the time we were working on this idea of, of you know, rare earth free magnets, but it really was not from an application standpoint. It was from a, a mm. fundamental uh, synthesis characterization computation standpoint. Right. So I went to the materials uh, department at, at UCSB in the materials research lab to to expand, to become a little bit more diverse in the types of materials that we were looking at. So I went and looked at oxides rather than borides. So kind of a, a transition there. Uh, and the, the application in this case was for uh, luminescent materials for LED lighting. Okay. So when you look at LED light bulbs, they all contain an LED chip, thus the name LED lighting. But this LED chip is a blue emitting LED light. So if you were to just take the sort of the base light of an LED, it would just be this horrendous bright blue, um, uh, bright blue light. And so what, what the LED light bulb has then is a, an inorganic solid called a phosphor that is coated on top of the LED light bulb. And so the purpose of the phosphor is to absorb the LED light and convert it into a broad spectrum emission that covers the entire visible spectrum. That's what we see is, is white light. And so uh, the, the task there was a little bit more of materials design, um, you know, going into lab and thinking about how do we make these materials more efficient? How do we control the color conversion process? How do we make them chemically and thermally robust? So that was uh, that was a fun, fun project to start. I worked with a really talented uh, graduate student as a, as a postdoc named Kristen Denault. And Kristen and I just crushed out science. You know, we we developed a lot of new materials, a, a lot of understanding. And then about, I'd say, maybe uh, halfway through, a uh, uh, quarter of the way through my my project, uh, Ram, you know, kind of figured out that I was good at computation as well. And so, you know, somewhat ironically enough, I went to Santa Barbara to learn how to, you know, become a little more applied, learn how to uh, uh, do material synthesis on oxides. And, uh, you know, when he figured out I was good at computation, he gave me a bunch of computational projects and said, here, go work on this. Uh but, you know, the one thing that he did was knowing that I was interested in becoming a faculty member, he built a, a good group of, of undergraduates and research students uh, around me that I could mentor, mm. right? So I could learn how to manage a little bit of a, a mini group in a lot of ways. And so, um, you know, he, he gave me opportunities to write papers, to finish up projects, to, to, to sort of manage projects uh, at that next level as a postdoc. And that, that really helped prepare me in ways that I didn't know I needed help in preparation sure. um, for, for how to run a, how to run a group today. Mm. Actually, a question I had that came up that I was just, I was just kind of thinking about is back to your graduate work. So like what for the, yeah. for the, for the magnetic um, uh, what's, I guess what would be like, what is like the, like, cause you were studying more the fundamentals, right? You said yeah. it's, at least at the time it was not at the time it was not necessarily like for application purposes. Well, one has it changed? Has it changed at all in the last I don't know ten years or so? But two, what what was like? I guess what would be like the bottleneck for that? And like, what would an ideal, uh, let's say, magnetic app like be? Yeah, yeah. So the so so it has it has changed a lot. I mean, I think it was probably by the top from when I started to when I finished my PhD. I think that progression had already started to happen. That we okay. were looking from from you know eight to twelve, uh, oh eight to to twenty twelve that hey, we've, we've got a, a, at least some challenges with these materials. We'd need to think a little bit more critically of uh, of them. And and so what does an optimum material look like? So what you really are, are looking at for these types of compounds is a, a large saturation magnetic moment, meaning they have a carry a lot of magnetic energy and a huge uh, hysteresis. And so the, 
the hysteresis is essentially if you you take a uh, magnet that's uh, magnetic material that's all, with all the uh, spins oriented one way, mm -hmm. what's sort of the energy that it takes to flip them all upside down or, or disorder that magnetization. So uh, where you would want a tremendously large hysteresis, you can imagine, is on your credit card or on your uh, your hard drive, if you have an old school, not solid state hard drive, but a spin disk hard drive. You know, because you don't want to accidentally walk into the NMR room, forget to take your wallet out and uh, demagnetize all your credit cards. <laughs> Something that does not have large hysteresis, that would happen very, very easily. Uh, the way you you sort of scrub a, uh, an old school hard drive, if you're not going to just, you know, mash it with a hammer or blow torches, take a magnet to it. And that's how you, that's how you do this, this demagnetization. Mm. It turns out that that rare earths have a lot of unpaired electrons, right? You're looking at in, in depending on the element seven unpaired electrons and then there's other properties like the the uh, uh spin orbit coupling that go into to sort of further driving the, the magnetic properties so this is why it ends up largely being a, a challenge is you you need the unpaired electronic spins coming from something like a rare earth so then how do you do that without a rare earth right it, it's it's uh it, it's a pretty pretty hefty uh hefty challenge to figure yeah. out how to get the spins you need and uh, uh, the hysteresis that you need in these types of, right. of compounds. Now, does... So, yeah, so... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask about the rare earth metals because this is kind of a problem, I guess, we also experience in the organic world, organic catalysis, where we talk about, like, yeah. the geopolitical pricing, a lot of these things. And so this is kind of a philosophy, like a philosophy thing. Well, one is, like, you know, do we have... America has to have deposits of rare mm -hmm. earth metals, right? But because of the way that we handle well the which maybe rightly so i don't I don't really know, but the way that we have regulations on those rare earth metals, we can't mine them, but other countries just happen to not really care or uh so they 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 will mine so you know yeah what like, I don't know i guess my I guess my question for you is like do you know if do we have does America have deposits for rare earth metals like could we Absolutely. do it in in theory yeah. Ab okay Absolutely. So, so in uh, uh, Southern California, between LA and, and Vegas, is a, a mine, and you can, I believe, see it from the five mm. uh, called Mountain Pass Mine, and and they they are, you know, sort of spooled spooled back up after a long sort of da more of a downtime in terms of of the production for exactly the reasons that you said. I mean, regulations for the for the better largely. Uh, you know, kind of came in and and, uh, and and I made it semi cost prohibitive to where for for a very long time it was was and still to this day is probably cheaper to to mine the elements and 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 you know more concerningly in terms of, of uh, like health like how uh, they do it and yeah it's pro mm. it's processing right yeah is is purifying these rare earths and so you know there there are there are core changes I mean there there are there are fundamental challenges, though, that that we're going to have to address in terms of of some of these issues, and that's that you know the there's a consulting group here in in uh, Houston called Wood McKenzie, you know, and they estimate that the the transition to a sort of a, a green energy future. So I think this is largely looking at things like batteries and solar cells, but I would imagine they take into account things like uh, uh, you know green catalysts and and whatnot. Um, was was looking at something like a trillion dollars of investment, broadly mm. speaking, to make this transition a reality. And if you think about today, if you want a a uh, a battery, you know, or, or a, a, an electric car, the amount of of new elements that are coming out of the ground to go into that car is still quite high. I mean, it, only recently can you go and buy a Coke bottle that is a hundred percent recycled plastic, right? <laughs> yeah. the, the challenges of recycling polymers are are huge. I can't imagine the challenges of recycling batteries and, and solar cells and all of this is, oh. is a, it's a, it is a task that I think chemistry chemists and engineers are up to. Um, but I think it's almost a question of, of, of willpower and funding to push these off. And I think you're going to start to see that more and more. It's probably already, probably already there and, and a little bit uh, naive for me to say that we aren't necessarily heavily invested in that. Um, you don't yeah. see it so much on the materials chemistry side, though, like you do on the inorganic material side, like you do on the organic material side. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. What about so? Uh, so you mentioned earlier about uh, let's say the it's not so much the mining itself, but the purification of these heart of these uh, rare earth metals. So what is the you know what are like? I mean, do you happen to know the process of doing that? Like what, like what that generally looks like, or for for the for the rare earths, I don't. Okay, I feel like I should, considering I went to went to Ames where they developed a lot of these <laughs> a lot of these processes. Yeah. But you know, I think I'm I think I'm like most people where they take for granted that you can just pop on Alpha and buy a five nines purity metal and yeah. just go from go from there. <laughs> yeah. um, that's certainly a thing that that is is probably worth putting a little bit of effort into figuring out how they, they actually do this. Cause there, there are probably opportunities to take some expertise that we have and, and think about that, mm, okay. think about that process. But right. yeah, sad, sadly, I can't, that's can't okay. answer that one. I am that's okay. far from the expert on that. That's okay. Well, it's a good, you acknowledge you're not an expert there. That's, that's <laughs> a lot of problem with that. You know, many academics, even industry people, like they'll talk on things that they just don't, they're not experts in. Um, uh, so yeah, we're kind of, I'm hopping every, I'm hopping everywhere, but sure, okay, sure, back, sure. back to, back to the, the postdoc and the, the, uh, the, your, your postdoc, uh, doctorate work, um, and the, the, the phosphorus unironically does not contain any phosphorus. I don't think so. Don't nope. get that confused nope. out there. Yep. Anyone. Um, yeah. So, and well, I guess that's interesting though, because that's at least part of your research now is, is still on this phosphorus. So yeah, seeing that yeah. project, I guess, start there and then come here. Um, what, you know, what's kind of changed since then? Like what, what's kind of been the, what's been the progression of, so from where you started to like, where I guess really where Shruti just graduated now. So like what kind of, how, yeah. Yeah. So at, at the time we were largely just looking at sort of, again, trying, trying to understand, starting from the, the basics, trying to understand the, the origin of optical properties in, in these materials. So the way that these, these phosphors work is they're essentially an, uh, all inorganic, uh, what I would call scaffold or, or host structure. So this would be something like uh, an yttrium aluminum oxide or a, like a garnet crystal structure uh, that has been substituted with a, a, uh, a rare earth uh, element, believe it or not, um, something like cerium or, or europium. And so these are things that you probably are, are semi-familiar with all uh, already in terms of like the idea of substituting, you know, so... Uh, yeah. Sapphire would be uh, an example of an element substituted into aluminum oxide. So, so it's the same base idea. The aluminum oxide is a, a scaffold. You put a little bit of an element like chromium in and you get, get these crazy properties. And depending on what element you put in, you get like sapphire and ruby and all of these uh, related, related compounds. Cool. So this is what, what we look at is, is how do we put the, what, what rare earth we put into what, what scaffold. You can imagine when we have a huge amount of the periodic table to, to work with, right? We're not limited to just just uh, carbon, nitrogen, and, and oxygen. I have, you know, eighty yeah. elements to, to to play with here. <laughs> uh, that we we don't really know necessarily what the mix and match when we mix and match what properties are, are going to look like. So at the time we were kind of working through it in a in a largely empirical or semi empirical way. You know, we were doing some calculations to try and understand it. Um, Today, we have a, a, a tremendously better understanding, uh, not just because of the work my group has done, but, but groups, groups around, around the world, both in industry sure. and, and academia. Think about the light bulbs that you bought at, uh, at Lowe's or Home Depot or your parents bought at Lowe's or Home Depot uh, 20 years ago. LED light bulbs were available. They were expensive and they weren't very good. Everyone sort of was like, ah, oh, you know, we've got these, but, but, but they kind of suck. Um, today... You basically go in and you you buy an LED light bulb and you're you're happy with it. Yeah, um, which is which is from an academic uh, or a research perspective an entire different beast for me to tackle. Um, but we can chat about that if if you're interested. In hearing I'm what I mean, definitely what I mean there. I'm definitely in. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna and put, so I'm going to put a pin uh, in that. We're going to come back to that. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for uh, where where we're at today is I'm now thinking a little bit more about. Uh, some of the ways that we can apply data science and machine learning because calculating the properties of these phosphors is is not straightforward because the the substitution of the rare earth into a host crystal structure brings a whole slew of of problems in terms of computational scale these are expensive calculations to do they're they're uh you know we have rare earth f orbitals to deal with which if you know anything about <laughs> computational modeling are, are a headache uh, and so machine learning is a is a beautiful 
uh, addition to the project and a natural addition to the project because it allows you largely to, to cross length scales, right? You no longer have to worry about what the dedicated electronic structure is if you have or are asking the right types of, of questions. If I want to predict what, what uh, specific orbitals are involved in the uh, excitation and emission process, machine learning is not going to give that to me. Mm. But if I want to know, for example, what does the excitation or emission spectra look like? If I have a database of excitation and emission spectra, certainly machine learning can predict that. So it kind of allows you to, to if you're creative in the way you ask questions, machine learning is a, is a fantastic addition to the project. And so we started to think then more a little bit about uh, specialty applications, thinking more about the not just light, light bulbs that you would put into uh, your, your house, but uh, the types of uh, phosphors that are going to go into displays. So in, in majority computers, today they're LED displays, right? You buy a TV, you, unless you're buying an OLED, you're buying an LED display. Uh, phosphors are used in there as, as well still today. And so looking at how do we make phosphors for those applications. For near IR uh, applications, you know, things like uh, biometrics, for horticultural lighting, for what, what uh, is being termed as uh, human-centric lighting. So thinking about how does light impact our physiological well-being and what can we do from a material standpoint to minimize those mm. impacts. So really from lighting, allow lighting to become sort of the commodity that it is and think about what are these really big subsets of lighting in the lighting industry that we never could never could play around with because we were stuck with uh, an incandescent or fluorescent light bulb. Okay. LED lighting, LED light bulbs really allow a lot of these applications. Okay. And so I guess... I so my question I guess my question is too is the main or at least one of the issues is is one is going to be the, is the rare earth metals right I mean in an ideal world you, you well let's say given that rare earth metals are an issue in the current state right just the way that we mine yeah. it and stuff like that okay given that the you you want to minimize the amount of rare earth metals used in these phosphors right yeah right? okay. Yep. Yeah. And that's kind of the main issue that you guys are kind of tackling here using. Well, so so this is one that's actually we're, we're not having to, to, to deal with this one that I had thought about. But a nice thing and something I would encourage, uh, you know, students, you if you have the, the opportunity to, uh, you know, sit down and talk with industry folks in your research area, because they'll tell you exactly what matters and what doesn't matter. Mm. And I have some connections in, in the lighting industry. And, you know, I say, hey, do you guys actually care about the the rare earths in there and their answer is no mm. no not really the reason being is that these are already a minor substituent in the in the composition of of matter so we are looking at at they the rare earth is essentially a dopant in the host structure five mole percent at most right right okay. so it's really not a large amount now on a world scale of light bulbs it's a lot but for the magnets you're looking at at you know, probably 80 mole percent or more of, of rare earth. Mm. So it's a, it's just a different scale. So, yeah, so we've thought about that as a concern and a research area. And we fortunately, right. We, we sort of did an about face and said, all right, not actually a real concern. Let's tackle some real challenges. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Cause it kind of, to me, it's kind of analogous to like, I guess the palladium used in, in organic catalysis where it's like, yeah, it's like people will say, oh yeah, palladium is, you know, rare earth metal or, or not or precious earth metal, I should say. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's toxic, all this jabber jabber, but you go to the pharmaceutical industries, they don't care. Like they, you know, they have rigorous purification techniques on one mole percent. You can make a, a slew of cross coupling reactions. So I, I kind of hear that. Um, yeah. So what it's not, are, it's not to say to not look at that area, but right. man, it, yeah. uh, to get funding, I feel it's, like it's, well, funding. Well, it, it sounds it's great good for to funding. be a, like, it sounds good for funding. Right, it sounds, it sounds good. good for funding. And this is, this is one of the uh, this is one of the challenges, right? right? Is is sometimes what's good for funding is not what's good for the actual process product or right or material. And that's the unfortunate thing, really. Well, for anything that's looking for funding, it's just the unfortunate thing. The best, the best, uh, the best ways forward are not necessarily the um, the most appealing for funding purposes. Yeah, but yeah. You know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Off. <laughs> um, so I guess, so then I guess, uh, my question, so what, what are the interesting challenges that your group is trying to tackle then with these, with this, with this specific project? 
Yeah. So in the in the lighting aspect, it really is now. It is a how do we design new materials? Mm. One of the the issues is that still today LED light bulbs are expensive. I mean, I think maybe they they've gotten tremendously better, but for a nice light bulb, you are still going to Lowe's or or Home Depot, um, and and you're spending two and three dollars per light bulb way better than the you know what it used to be the the ten dollar light bulbs twenty dollar light bulbs you could still buy ten and twenty dollar right. uh light bulbs um but i will say that by and large i mean i'm sure um you know things like uh wire cutter would would argue with this since they go and, and kind of do some rigorous testing or whatever site you want not necessarily promoting wire cutter that just happens to be the one that, <laughs> that I, I click on um and and uh you know you you often get what you pay for you're gonna buy a two dollar light bulb everyone has an experience you know led light bulbs are touted as something that'll last for 10 years and and all of a sudden you have you buy one you spend uh two dollars on it and you're like this thing already broke i just bought it four months ago yeah you get what you pay for right um and so still if you go and, and can buy an incandescent light bulb they're selling four packs for a dollar right so the the Two dollars may not necessarily seem like a lot, but compared to twenty-five cents for a more way more energy inefficient incandescent bulb, it is a lot. Hmm. And then you start thinking about, okay, you know, what world do I live in where I'm like, oh yes, I'll spend uh, two, three, ten dollars on this light bulb when there's a significant portion of the the world where that's a daily salary and they're not even coming close coming close to that. Hmm. So we got to think about how do we get these light bulbs cheaper? How do we get them? Uh, how do we get them cheaper? And a lot of it is is um bringing down costs of the specific components um phosphors are a a smaller component than not but certainly it is still going into the cost and that cost is is driven largely by at least from my viewpoint uh ip constraints because for every similar to catalysis for every uh light bulb that is made in the world there's maybe maybe a cup, you know, two out of there's 10 fosters in the world that right. they can choose from that work. Mm -hmm. Right. So very, very constrained, um, space. And so we're looking at how do we, if we develop new materials that work, uh, you know, uh, perhaps we can at least break that open. And to be honest, I'm not fully altruistic. And then of course, if we get something that works, I'm patenting that thing as well. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I am, I am retiring. Yeah. And you know, fair enough. That's, uh, that's <laughs> fair enough. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess on that, I'm kind of interested to hear more about, I guess, the computational aspect and machine learning aspect, because I'm a little, sure. I'm a little bit familiar with, with, uh, computational chemistry, at least from a catalysis point of view and understanding, um, how ligands and metals and how the electronic properties we can draw from that. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit familiar, the machine learning I'm not familiar with at all. Yeah. So what are the sort of calculations that your group runs? What are the, what are the, what are the, um, do you guys try to model spectroscopy data? You know, what are the points that you guys are trying to pull out from the data that like you guys are specifically looking for? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's uh, so on the the computational side, these are all density functional theory type type calculations. So it's where you know, with the rare earths, we have sort of some some fundamental challenges of how do we describe the electronic structure of the rare earth? Um, these are solid state uh methods so we use uh you know they're all done in, in reciprocal space following band structure theory and but but it is exactly that right so we're looking at, at you know what types of approaches can we use to to calculate excited state spectra uh, spectra to to get spectroscopy and then use it as a little bit of a you know we we go um uh, both directions with it you know sometimes it's more efficient to make a new material uh, or compound in the lab, mm. and then come back to the, the the computer and say, "Hey, why does this have the properties that it does?" Um, or, you know, in a in a uh, perfect world, we take something new that we have and we look at different elemental substitutions and think, "Can we predict what the uh, what the spectra is going to look like and go in and and make it?" Uh, I would bet we have probably a twenty five percent process on the actual sort of. Uh, uh, forward process, and then uh, you know, seventy five percent of our effort largely is in is in understanding. Right now, machine learning is 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 certainly the opposite, right? I mean, it's it's all about predictive predictive forward, telling us where we want to go, what do we want right. to what we want to look at, and uh, 
you know, in that process, what was it kind of was saying, what we're looking at is taking spectroscopic data that's already been measured and using that as, as training data to build models mm. and then look at new compositions of matter, predict what those properties would look like and hope that they, uh, hope that they match. And we are in the phosphor world. We're probably the, among the leaders in that, in that area. Uh, we were, it's gaining, you know, people are, are, are gaining and gaining on it, but we were sort of there first and have, have really been pushing that area, yeah. that area forward. Now, machine learning is, is generally, is generally, I would say new to even chemistry in general. I feel like it just, it, but yeah. it's, uh, it's definitely taking steam. Do you mind just briefly explaining how machine learning works, at least in the chemistry sense? Like how, like what is you, I know you basically, you have a function you're trying to target and it gives you, it tells you the next place yeah. to go, but how does that actually work in practice? Yeah. Yeah. So, so machine learning in, in chemistry and in material science, really, I mean, as, as I was sort of in the right place at the right time with the right interests. Um, so, we, so when I started here in 2014, you know, it was sort of really just coming on to the scene. I would say the, the first, the, it was always sort of there, right. right? There were people that were always kind of doing this for, for a long time, you know, as, as sort of an outcrop of, of, early combinatorial efforts, right? Big combinatorial chemistry done in, in the eighties and, and, uh, or maybe the nineties and, and 2000. So it kind of, it was always kind of there, but, but in about 2012 or so, it really started to take off. And that was pushed largely by, uh, an Obama era policy, I guess you would call it, or, or focus mm. on what was called on the material side called the materials genome initiative. And the idea here was, was that we could use computational modeling to, uh, sort of, you know, design, design materials. And that was, uh, you know, something that came out in, in, you know, 2008, 2010. So 2012 was when the first products of that started to come out. And that was a lot of the high throughput computational model, right? You know, and, and calculations is, as a lot of people know, have, have a lot of power, but a, a lot of limitations and scalability. And it gets better and better every day as, as, you know, new and new and better supercomputers come online. Uh, but really, there was there's always this fundamental limit because computation, at, in, you know, at least at the DFT level, scales cubically, right? So you are indefinitely behind as a comp composition gets more complex. Right. Well, you're gonna need you're gonna need way more power. Uh, so machine learning was a natural bridge to take the, all of this computational data because for all machine learning projects, you have to have some sort of training data set mm. information. Right. So for all machine learning, and this is everything that has percolated your life, whether or not you realize it. Uh, you know, all of these, the, you know, your, your, your cash history, your, your phone, everything is tracking all of this information. Uh, you know, if you don't, if you don't want it, that's, that's totally fine. But I can tell you this, your machine learning predictions of telling you what you want to eat for dinner are not going to be nearly as good. You know, and that's, that's sort of the, the trade-off. talk about things Me? and then it shows up on Amazon, like, I want to buy, I want to get some shoes and then it shows up on your Amazon. Like that is not coincidence. I don't know. <laughs> it is not, it is not, a, it is not a, it's not a coincidence, but you know, does it make your life a little bit easier? None of us have uh butlers that can go buy us, uh, pick up our shoes. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not complaining. It's, it's a, <laughs> it shows you my, so, my interest so, right? that's right. So, so in, in chemistry itself, now all of this computational data was, was available and more importantly, it was well curated, right? So we've always had data available, right? Think of, of all of the journals, right? We have 200 some years worth of, of journals, but well curated, uh, even though they were maybe well curated journals, it was all, all in print and digitizing that print is a challenge, right? And so with computation, they took the computation and they dumped it into well curated uh, data or reasonably well curated data sets that you could then use an API where you could literally go in and just pull and download all of this data in whatever sort of format you want. And that was the transition that allowed machine learning to, to, to sort of come in was access to, to, <laughs> to data. I cannot imagine um, that job taking all the print and making it digital. I cannot imagine that job. <laughs> yeah. Companies like Google have spent a lot of money in figuring out how to, yeah. how to automate this process and, and clean it up. And so they, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, even today though, it's still not, not perfect. So if we're not using computation, so one of the things, as you can imagine with spectroscopic data, uh, People have figured out how, you know, methods to digitize, you know, uh, photo uh, excitation and, and photoluminescence data. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, oftentimes you still have to be 
uh, have a good good eye for the actual chemistry? Do the data make sense? Or did someone just sort of sneak something through the peer review process? And so we go through and still clean a lot of that, that data. Um, but yeah, so once you have this, this training data set, then you know, a lot of work in what's known as, as sort of featureization, taking and describing this molecule or this solid to the computational model. And, and there's a variety of different methods in the molecular world. That's what you would hear people talk about smiles strings. Mm. So that's a way that you can describe the comp composition and, and structure to a model in the solid state. We have graph networks, um, a bunch of different uh, compositional uh, features. Mm. And then you take the, the data, you take the features, and then you run them through, uh, honestly, today, largely sort of uh, turnkey approaches, uh, things like what's called scikit-learn. You can go and get it. It's in in Python, you basically, if you learn Python, learn a bit, a little bit of machine learning, you can jump into this mm. field. The challenge is asking the right questions, right. as I kind of said, said, said before, um, more so than ever, because it is really borderline stupidly easy to get into machine learning. Right. And there are fortunately a lot of, um, not manuals, but a lot of best practices papers out there across the fields that that I would encourage everyone to look at as if they want to jump into this, because it tells you about how to make sure that you're not getting uh, sort of, you know, overfit models, mm. bunk predictions, things that could really easily probably pass pass the smell test in a lot of ways, even if they're they're fundamentally wrong mm. um, for, for some reason. And so um, it's it's an exciting it's an exciting time. The field is is growing really rapidly across the board. Fortunately, I honestly thought if you would have asked me, uh, whatever nine years ago, eight years ago when we uh, first started putting out our, our early machine learning papers, the field is in a much better place than I honestly thought it would be. I thought there would be a lot more noise and and sort of, well, for lack of a better phrase, uh, crappiness out there. Uh, that we would have to be sifting through. It's out there, but it's not nearly as, as much as, as it is. And I think it's because the machine learning community really did get together early on right. and say, here are the best practices. Here's what we need to do. Here's mm -hmm. what we want to see. And people follow that, which is nice. Yeah. Which is nice. It's uh, Yeah, that is, that is really cool. On the computation side, you mentioned earlier you, you model your molecules using DFT. Now, mm -hmm. um, I guess from the organic catalysis side, uh, speaking with one of our computational experts, like I know that mo let's say mo modeling like die radicals or like, let's say you have a ligand backbone with two unpaired electrons, DFT can be notoriously bad at doing that. Uh, so with your, with your materials, having multiple unpaired electrons, you definitely can provide yeah. some, some, um, knowledge to this for me, but I wouldn't DFT then be a bad, um, model yeah, for, yeah. for these types of materials. Yeah, it's then? not. Nope, it's it, it's not great. You really put a lot of hand waviness in it. To okay. be honest, I don't know. The hand waviness is wrong. You put a lot of of uh, yeah corrections, mm. little correction factors. It is so so where but where DFT, I won't say is always right, but largely right. You know, and this is one of the nice things. So so as you can can maybe gather, my group does both the computation as well as all of the synthetic chemistry, right. and so we can sort of put on our experimental hat or our computational hat. And often from our computational side, we're rarely trying to be purely quantitative, right? Mm. There are a lot of groups that, that are doing, you know, sole computational work and their goal is to be as quantitative as possible. And that's great. Right. Um, but, but we don't need that, right? We just need, we just need to be uh, qualitative, you know, at best semi-quantitative is, is fantastic because nine times out of 10, we're comparing a series and, and, the qualitative nature becomes less important when you have, sorry, the quantitative nature becomes less important when you have qualitative comparisons right. that you can make. So a lot of our assumptions, you know, we sort of just uniformly make these assumptions and it allows us to at least draw broad trends. And at the end of the day, I'm never going to want to be or care to be quant computationally quantitative mm. because I have an experiment and, you know, whatever comes off the instrument is in fact what I am what I'm right. measuring. So it's, it's a really nice advantage to be able to put on both, both, uh, both hats, depending on what we're, uh, what we're trying to get at. And again, that, that goes back to allowing us to ask the right questions. If we know experimentally what we're trying to get at, what data we have, then we are able to, um, design computational models or, or 
machine learning models to answer some of these or or use these data address some of these these questions yeah uh, that, that was largely why uh, why my group does both one i was of course trained in this way so i'm fairly unique in that but we we drive it forward and keep this focus because largely what i want to see is is my students being able to to cross these traditional boundaries and communicate clearly with with people who are either on the computational side or the experimental side. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a question I wanted to bring up because I mean, that's, that's a thing we hear all the time. It's like, if you had the spectroscopic data, if you had the experimental data, then like, that's, that's, that's more, that's absolute. Like that is, that is what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, as long as, yeah. it, as long as the computational data, I guess, kind of matches that, or you're able to pull trends from that. I think that's, you know, a perfect, that is a perfect, that is that's, literally the application, yeah. right. As yeah. best. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and it's I mean there's there's definitely the the quanti the quantitative ability to 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 calculate uh, you know spectra full on I think it's it's everything will push that direction but but for for today with some of the challenges in terms of materials design mm -hmm. uh, you know it's it's great to go go this uh, yeah. qual qualitative experimental validation approach. Now, some other projects that you have going on in your group. I know, I know you also work in, I guess, generally, I guess you would say super hard materials, I guess. So yeah, super hard. Materials, what, sure. So first, what does that even mean? Like what, what is super hard? Like, what, what is soft? What <laughs> yeah, is hard? So, so uh, a little bit of, of broader, broader background. So my, as I said, my PhD with uh, magnetism and the borides um, after, after that, I vowed to never do magnetism mm -hmm. uh, again, because Magnetism is in the solid state in particular is, is hard, right? You guys are in the molecular world or maybe, maybe you wouldn't consider yourself lucky, but the fact that you can run a column to purify something is unbelievably <laughs> lucky. Um, I can't do that, right? What I synthesize in a metal is what I get, right? So the way that we make these borides, um, boron is one of the highest melting point elements on the periodic table. So how do you make it reactive? You literally hit it with, with a bolt of lightning. Right, you put it in what's called an arc melter, and this is the way that a lot of metal metallurgy is done. So, if I want to make something like, let's just say, titanium boron, I take titanium metal and boron metal, I grind them together, or, or even just set them next to each other. I put it into a, a bell jar that I pull a vacuum, and then on uh, backfill it with argon, and we have an electrode that is connected to a welding generator, like a legitimate welding generator that we could weld with. Oh boy! Uh, and then you basically put a massive bias on a, a thoriated tungsten electrode. Uh, that has a positive uh, charge on one end, a ground on the other, pull that in the argon plasma, uh, argon gas, and you create an argon plasma. And you oh, melt man. it. So that's like 3000 Celsius. You can imagine I have absolutely no kinetic control at 3000 degrees Celsius. So what cools down is, is what I get. There's no purification possible. So magnetism is unbelievably sensitive. And so in that case, if you have even the smallest impurities that maybe you can't see by really any uh, diffraction techniques, spectroscopic techniques, or micro microscopy techniques. Right. Well, you're going to see it by magnetism. So I said I'd never do magnetism again. Question becomes: What else do you do with uh, borides? Well, mechanical properties. Right. These are these are famous structural uh, structural materials. Um, so we're interested in, in taking and in, in looking at how do we we understand the mechanical properties. Um, so hardness is the one that we largely uh, largely look at. So hardness is really just exactly what you would think it's resistance to, to deformation so if you take a surface and push on it how much force does it take to deform mm. the the surface and leave an imprint or an in, indent um and so we're we're again using computation to sort of calculate uh how these metals in the borides bond and what does what does bonding look like sort of uh, for different elements and how can we connect to that bonding nature you know is it a strong covalent bond or a weak covalent bond does that give good mechanical properties or bad mechanical properties? We also do machine learning because as you can, can uh, imagine, hardness spans many length scales. So just like a piece of wood, wood is not hard because necess only because of the the carbon-carbon bonding in the wood, but it also has to do with things like the grain structure. Mm. Metals are the same. So it's not just about the metal-metal bonding, but it's also about the grain structure of, of, uh, of these metals. Um, a great classic example of this would be like... Uh, uh, cold rolled steel. So if you ever think about like steel, they take and they do all of this processing or 
or if you ever watch those like knife making shows on Netflix, right? They take, they fire, and then what do they do? They hammer it. Yeah. Right. When they're hammering it on the anvil, they're actually changing the the grain structure mm. or the microstructure. And so uh, DFT cannot capture this this microstructure or changes in it. But machine learning can span length scales. And so we're able to capture things and understand things like grain structure through, say, image processing techniques. You get a micrograph from an SEM of the grain structure, just like you would with wood. You can sort of connect the grain structure back to the mechanical problems. Yeah. So our goal there is to think about how do we make materials that have a high hardness that you can go to Home Depot and buy and say uh, sandpapers or uh, drill bits or skill saw blades, for mm -hmm. example. And are you looking at like all the different elements on the periodic table or are there are specific groups that you're kind of looking at like so yeah so here's one where where we are trying to look at getting away from expensive metals and into the 3d transition metals. Mm. so in the boride chemistry space the best materials today largely are uh tungsten osmium uh, uh, uh rhenium the the quite expensive ones not the precious uh, five Ds, but the earlier, earlier five Ds. Yeah, these aren't horribly expensive, but they're not, they're not cheap. Right? Yeah, and so if we could start thinking about making some of these with, uh, with some of the other cheaper elements, then that's what we would look at because they are a large mole fraction of, of, uh, of metals. Mm. And then we start thinking also about you know how do we take and balance mechanical properties. So there's this, this classic. Uh, inverse relationship between hardness and ductility mm. right so the harder something is the more brittle it tends to be right diamond is a great example of this that diamonds of course are the hardest mineral known and the hardest material known uh, but believe it or not you can actually if you have a diamond ring if you are uh, let's say you're a wealthy individual and you have a giant rock on your <laughs> finger you can actually take and, and if you hit this against a door or something you can crack a diamond reasonably easily mm. um, and and you know, on a more day-to-day -day basis, something like then Gorilla Glass, you can imagine on your, your iPhone is a beautiful balance of both because you don't want to sort of tap your screen and break it, but you also want it to be reasonably, say, fracture resistant or have high fracture toughness. Because if you don't just hit it square on, but you hit it on the side, you don't want that crack to propagate across your screen, mm. which as everyone knows, happens pretty readily. Go to your first generation iPhone and your current iPhone and look at how much better they are today in terms of the fracture toughness. We're on something like oh, cool. fourth generation or fifth generation Gorilla Glass. Um, so glasses are different than these. We're looking at crystalline materials. So we're trying to think about how do we institute some of these same properties in crystalline materials. Okay. So, but you're also, at this point, I guess it's more fundamental than, let's say, application purposes. Like, uh, like. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. On, on the balancing of the properties, yes, because I don't think anyone really has a great idea in a, in a crystalline solid how how to do this. We have some ideas. My former student, uh, Arya Mansori Tarani, who was graduated probably right before you started here, yeah. um, was working on some of these, okay. these challenges. Again, from a DFT standpoint, thinking, okay, if we look at how the bonding changes under strain, can we think about how to exploit these changes in bonding mm. so that they're able to, uh, to really maximize uh, strain resistance or fracture toughness? That's really cool. Um, that's really yeah. cool. Jacob's been doing some of it, but unfortunately, due to no fault of his own, the little success. It's a it is a big, big problem. It big seems challenge. like yeah. I I, uh, I talk to him casually sometimes when we're, when we're out, and uh, yeah, it seems it seems like it's very difficult. I mean, I don't I don't envy it, but I I uh, <laughs> but the thing is, I I, I I bet it'll have a huge payoff though. So we we were talking about uh, graduate school can be laborious sometimes. But that's sludge, but I think it will have a payoff. And so I'm excited to see. I'm excited to see what happens with it. I'm excited to see if there's any, you guys yeah. are able to develop any correlations with that and see where it goes in the future. Um, but just some other projects you got going on. So I know you do, yeah. um, you know, I guess nanophosphors, right, for bi biological assays, right? So yeah. that's, well, I guess, I guess it is, well, it's completely different, I guess, in some sense, <laughs> than your, uh, commercially available phosphorus. So I'll kind of let you take yes. the, I'll let you take the reins on this because, you know, <laughs> yes. what's so, going on there. So this one, this is, a, this is a cool one. This is one of these beautiful examples of a natural collaboration that, that sort of spun out of just some, some semi, semi casual discussions and, and colleague recommendations, we'll say. So um, 
my uh, my colleague over in in chemical engineering, Richard Wilson, is a world renowned expert in in a uh, testing technology called a lateral flow assay. So these are unbelievably common. Everyone uh, has has seen these. This would be like your home pregnancy test, right? Or today a COVID test. And so the the lateral flow assay uh, basically works. You know, if you have sort of the you, you take you you put your uh, whatever you want to, to test on to the test strip, and then you let it sort of wick along the membrane, and then you're going to get maybe two colored lines if it's positive, or one colored line if it's if it's a negative mm -hmm. test, right? So COVID or 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 um, uh, the home pregnancy test. So the the lines being formed as as colors are uh, often gold nanoparticles, and so uh, Richard looks at, at new architectures and how to improve improve these tests over in in uh, chem. Uh, Kevin and, and he had worked closely or, or still does work closely with my other colleague here in chemistry uh randy lee and randy is an expert in making gold nanoparticles right one of the best there is at gold nanoparticle synthesis so they worked together for for a while and at one point uh you know richard had had this idea that maybe uh you could take instead and use glow in the dark material to perhaps instead of having a colored line on your test you could have a test that is just a line where it's it's glowing and so they they kind of pursued this for a little bit uh you know just trying different commercial materials that are out there and, and having a little bit of of success and and uh you know when this project was started would have been right when i got hired in, in 14 and in 15. And mm. so uh you know richard through the recommendation of of randy you know it was like randy told him you need luminescent materials it turns out that we hired a world expert in luminescent materials hey. and so yeah and so i said all right that's that so richard reached out and uh you know said do you want to work on this with us you know making you know we have to make these as nanoparticles so that they can sort of go through the lateral flow in, in phosphorus for lighting you're talking about 20 microns of particle size yeah um, so far too big they would plug the channels of the the membrane but you know they said can you make these as nanoparticles uh, put them in our test. And, and I said, absolutely. Sounds pretty easy, <laughs> which is, as you can imagine, famous, yeah. famous last words. So, uh, you know, here we are, uh, seven, seven, eight, eight years later, uh, and NIH grants, some internal funding. Uh, and we definitely have, have figured out how to make this work. Uh, he had a couple really talented students. They have a, a startup company out in the Bay Area. Uh, started as called Luminostics. They're now known as, as Clip Health. Uh, they were making COVID tests, making COVID uh, flu tests, yeah. and they uh, they they've been been really cool in, in pushing this idea forward. Uh, but yeah, it was it was three PhD students worth of work to to get this to get this functional. And that was uh, so all that's, just that's what we do. So and that was all basically just downscaling it, right? Because like, is that where the large bottle just getting? Yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. So so taking these materials and as you as you as you take them into the nanoparticles, of course the everyone's sort of favorite thing of why do we go to nano is because we have more surface area well in a luminescent material more surface area is bad because that's more space for defects mm. and defects kill luminescence in a solid and so you really have to think we had to figure out how to get these things into the nano size mm. without implementing tons and tons of of defects and that's just on the, the material side right richard's group had to go through and figure out how to make these things uh you know uh chemically robust figure out how to get them functionalized get them uh conjugated get them into a test get them to release from the conjugate pad on these lfas um, how to flow how to how to uh, bind at the test line so that a lot of a lot of both materials chemistry and um, sort of bioengineering went into the development of this but um, we had some some great students like i said three three phds uh that that really did some from fa some fantastic work to make uh the vision become a reality yeah and where's the where's the the future of like this project like where is where is it now yeah so so now uh what we had been working on most recently is thinking about how to do what's called multiplexing right mm. so you can imagine that today if you have just one uh you know a test let's say you have for example the covid covid flu test Right, you could do something as easy as you know having three lines: one line for COVID, one line for the flu, uh, like influenza, and one line that's your 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 test line. You know, our vision is how to make these even more complex because when you no longer just have colors, uh, no longer just have lines, sort of spatial 
uh, spatial recognition, but luminescent recognition, where you could have one that you have, you know, multiple lines and multiple emission colors. Mm. Right? So not just emitting, say, green, but emitting blue, green, and red. And now you have something where you can imagine just truly multi-scale right. uh, expansion up to nine plexes, 12 plexes, whatever you kind of have space for. Um, we've done some initial work. That was the last graduate student uh, who, who finished up in our uh, in our group was doing these multiplex testing. So, so we showed it that it could be done easily for a, a, a duplex. Mm, cool. How do we take it? Yeah. Build that out more. Applications yep. not with is still still coming in coming into play here. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. I guess so. As we kind of wrap up here, I have a couple couple of uh, you know questions for you. So, you know, where you know if you're a prospective graduate student coming into the Bargash lab, you know, what are kind of the expectations, and you know what where the you know Where's the general future of like, of this, of these fields, you think? Yeah. Yeah. So the, you know, one of the first things that I always get asked, always get asked is, you know, I don't have a background in, in programming. Mm. You know, it's the first, the first thing that I, I say is that's, that's okay. I, I didn't, I didn't either, you know, uh, can you turn on a computer? Right. That's the first thing. And, uh, if you can do that, then you can, then you can be be successful if you are willing to learn, mm. right? Frankly, if you're not willing to learn, maybe graduate school isn't necessarily your thing anyway. Uh, but you know, are you willing to to sort of put put aside your um, your concerns about not knowing something and just say, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in and do this. You know, log on to YouTube. The number of tutorials on Coursera on YouTube. You can you can learn it. This is how I learned it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, I will always hire a chemistry student who is willing to learn, uh, programming because the ability to hire someone who can program and teach them chemistry is basically a non-starter, <laughs> right? I don't know any computer science students who can come in and tell me what a covalent bond is, but at the end of the day, well, what's, a bond, teach, uh, what's a bond though? Hang on. What's a bond though? What, what, what is a bond? What is a bond? <laughs> that famous um, paper. So, yes. So I, uh, so that, that's sort of it, right? You know, it's someone who comes in and, and is, is willing to learn. I'll, I'll, I teach you how to ask the right questions, mm. right? I teach you how to do this. If you can learn the basic process, we can, we can work together. So that's what, that's what I look for. I look for a student who is willing to sort of put semi, put caution to the side, not in the laboratory setting, of course, but in a, in a, in a thought process setting, put caution to the, throw caution to the wind and just run with it. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, we'll figure out how to put it, put it together later. As I said, my belief in a PhD is never about one specific project or reaction type. It's about teaching a student how to think on their feet, because at the end of the day, you're going to get a job, be it in industry or academia. Uh, and you are not necessarily forever going to be in front of a bench running columns. Yeah. At some point you're going to have to be, uh, a, a, a leader, a group leader, a company leader, a project leader, and that involves problem solving, right? It is essentially just scientific project management is mm. what I, what I focus on. Yeah. Um, the, the science is just the outcome, uh, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. And so thinking, uh, about that, that's really what I look for students who are, who kind of are willing to buy into that, Fair enough. buy into yeah. that process where the projects are, are going. Yeah. So on the lighting side, it's thinking about how do we get into some of these, these specialty applications, make near IR materials, make, uh, materials for horticultural lighting materials for, as I kind of said, this human centric lighting idea. Um, you know, earlier I sort of said that, the, that lighting is, is it's an odd field. It's an academic to be in because when I have to write a grant, it is, you know, I can always say that we need new light bulbs, but it's really hard to convince people that we need new light bulbs when you can go into home Depot and buy a pretty damn good light bulb for $2. Right. As I've always said to my, my colleagues doing batteries, I'm really jealous of the fact that, that they have all these beautiful pictures, for better or worse, of Teslas on fire and airplanes on fire and computers that have exploded, <laughs> right? Because that's an easy a sales pitch. On your first page, put a picture of an airplane on fire and boom, there you go. Yeah. We need new batteries because we don't want this to happen. What I need, I need light bulbs that just randomly start exploding, yeah. right? I just need you to be sitting right there and then the light bulb in that fan behind you. I need it to just randomly explode, <laughs> put a shard of glass into your arm, and then I'll take and put that picture 
in a grant and say, we need, we need new lighting material so we don't <laughs> throw glass everywhere. Industry has done too well. They made all of the right decisions for a long time. Right. There were early discussions from the lighting industry. You know, should we keep the same form factor? Meaning, should the light bulb today look the same as a, or similar to the light bulbs that Edison designed? What's called the A19 form factor, right? Going to Home Depot, buy an incandescent bulb and an, and an LED light bulb, they're identical, right? That was, that was a decision that was consciously made mm. to keep them the same. Why? Because then people won't be scared, right? They're not going to be worried about changing out their light bulb. They're going to make the, the right decision to put in the more energy efficient light bulb. Mm. So all of these right decisions have made it harder for me to convince people that there is a problem here. That's okay. That's, that's, that's fine. I, you know, I will move on and we'll move into, uh, other, other, uh, you know, specific fields, for example. Right. And then some other, some other things um, too, is for, uh, I actually wanted to, I guess I definitely want to touch on this too. You were also the, the, um, Texas center for superconductivity. So you yeah, mind speaking sure, on that sure. a little bit too, like, what is that? Um, cause I mean, obviously like coming, coming to Houston, um, like it definitely is an energy capital. So like there definitely is, yeah. um, you know, room for, I would say that type of field and chemistry and stuff like that. So, yeah I, yeah, I don't know. I I don't even know what that is. So I don't know if you want to speak on that a little. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something. It's something that I think uh, the chemistry department. You know, we we promote more and more, but but largely, I think the students who come in to do organic don't even know that this thing that this thing necessarily exists. So, um, so Texas is the home for the the Texas Center for for superconductivity, and at least until recently, you know, Houston was the home to the invention of the highest TC superconductor, the the superconductor that has the highest operating temperature above above uh, liquid nitrogen. Mm. So th these were uh, invented in the, the late 80s, early 90s by a, a professor named Paul Chu, who's still here today over in in, uh, in physics. Uh, and and when Paul had these these uh, inventions, you know, shortly thereafter, uh, the state of Texas uh, founded or supported the, the establishment of the center to further advance super super conductivity. Um, so, so, uh, the center still has a, a huge foot, footprint in superconductivity. So you might've heard more recently about all these really exciting discoveries of approaching room temperature, superconductivity at these really high pressure in these materials called hydrides. Um, you know, so U of H is, is sort of, this is not work from U of H, but it's, uh, you know, being pursued here, um, uh, in, in parallel and in collaboration with some of these really exciting, uh, uh, developments. Mm. But it's also expanded out. So there was for a, a, a lot of work on uh, just energy materials broadly. So things called uh, thermoelectrics, right? Okay. So thermoelectrics take and convert uh, heat into electricity. That's how you, you power, say, uh, space stations or uh, satellites. You know, you, you uh, are able to generate electricity from a huge temperature gradient of, say, space to like a plutonium nuclear core mm. is how whatever the, the, the satellites get their electricity from. And so, um, so, so there's a, a huge effort in that our super hard materials. That's actually where, where we get part of our funding for our, for super hard materials. Uh, they have a, a, a large effort in, in processing of superconductors, taking superconductors and actually making them into things that we use every day, understanding how superconductors can go into things like, uh, MRIs right on the bio, uh, biophysical side. Right. So there's a, a lot of, of, uh, Cool work that comes out of this center, both on the fundamental applied physics side, on the materials chemistry side, and on the uh, applied manufacturing side uh, as well. Now, so, but do other, I would say, do other, like, either universities or states have something like this? So, like, like what what is what is the competitive advantage, let's say, coming to, like, a UH where you have this tech center for superconductivity versus, like, let's say, other institutions or states? Like, is there a competitive yeah, advantage? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that I sort of, you know, uh, uh, I guess didn't mention this or, or glossed over this is that Houston has a tremendous history of solid state physics and, and chemistry. Okay. You know, so um, as I said, I you know, I went to Iowa State sort of lucking into the fact that I ended up doing solid state chemistry at a historic strong place. Well, Houston is probably one of the other places that is is historically strong. And so... Um, having the the center really you know we have people like uh my colleague arnold Bouloy, who is is a historic expert in understanding superconductivity and sort of non-traditional superconducting materials paul chu who in, 
and I will say not certainly uh, is a historic leader in in the field. You know, there from from the very beginning on the thermoelectric side, uh, people like Ji Feng Ren uh, are are among the the top thermoelectric research groups. So we have a lot of groups that that span across physics and, and chemistry and, and engineering, and so other schools certainly have this. You know, but you know, some are more specialized in, say, soft materials, if you think of, of more, the more polymer heavy schools mm. on the inorganic material side. They're, they're out there, you know, schools like Santa Barbara and Northwestern. Um, but here we really are, are among the leaders in, in having that type of resource. And where you have professors who are world leaders, you have, you have top resources. Right. That's the last thing I wanted to ask you is before we close up here is, uh, I talked to Jacob sometime, and uh, you know you guys go play hockey every once in a while. So, yeah, how are we looking for these NHL playoffs? Have you been following this? I you know who do you support here, so, or so, are you? So I'm I'm a I'm an Avalanche fan, and so they lost in the first round in Game Seven. So mm. I can't decide if I'm going to boycott uh, boycott the rest <laughs> of it out of out of principle. But you guys had, hey, but uh, you guys won a few Stanley Cups as the defending like, yeah as 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 a defending champ. You know it was a a tough one, but man, they had. It was among the shortest off seasons in history for the late run that they had, and then the slightly earlier start. Yeah, they were just beat up all year. They had among the highest uh, number of man games lost uh, in a an exorbitant amount of money of uh, salary cap on the IR most of the year. So it was a it was a tough year. I'm actually pretty happy they made the the run mm. the run they did. They lost to to Seattle, which is you know the NHL the way that they've done these two expansion teams is kind of. Interesting, right? What was because the second one? I know Seattle sport. Kraken. What was the second one? Expansion yep. team. The the Vegas uh, expanded three years ago, four years. Okay. Ago, the Las Vegas Golden Knights. Yeah, okay. I didn't know they were still. So, I didn't know they were still considered an expansion because I know they like. Well, you know they they are reasonable. I mean, the fact that they're also in the second round of the playoffs right. as a, a fourth year team. And didn't you know, they the, make the, the Seneca playoffs? Really recent, or I mean, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, the final. Made, the final uh, the, anyways. Uh, what if they, like they won yeah, the. One. Uh, the conference they didn't they haven't won one yet but they made it deep okay. a couple years okay. in a row now okay and so the you know that i hate i i both love and hate to see it because i'm of the opinion that you know when you have a team everyone has to go through that that period of that just like period oh we start up yeah the grind period of of we suck for them you know for teams to come out and just be good right off the bat is fantastic for the local market but that 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 bitterness. Well, did they? Will, I assume they would draft up. well, and they probably get really good free agents from a lot of the. Yeah. Like, so so all their so the way that the NHL has done their expansion this is essentially that the or you know sort of in generalities that the, the teams can every team can protect a set number of players, mm. and then the expansion teams can sort of pick. say pick from the rest, still falling within line of the salary cap. Limits. Right. Okay. And so it allows you to build build a team. Not necessarily just from, say, a, a rookie free agent draft class or a farm team or something like that. You're right. So you're taking high caliber players and building a, a market. So I think that it's actually done in a, to me in a in a creative way that has allowed good support locally, and I think that's important. You're right. I am, you know, there's all this discussion constantly of of pro teams coming to to Houston and whether or not, for example, we'll get get the Coyotes as they sort of have their their local challenges in, in Tempe. I would love I would love to see uh love to see an NHL team come to Were Houston. Were the Coyotes team. originally in, in Houston and they moved to Arizona? No, the Coyotes they've been in Phoenix for a long time. I don't remember where they came from. Okay. But didn't Houston have a Houston, team? Didn't Houston have Houston it? had a NHL team. Houston had a uh one no, they had an NHL team. They had an at the time an a IHL AHL team. So okay. one below the NHL called the Houston Arrows. That's right. Uh, they moved to Des Moines okay. um, the, in 2012 or 13, so I never got to see them play. But everyone said that the games were, were fantastic and there was a pretty good support. Mm. So the, the, the Toyota Center uh, is where they, they uh, played. They sort of got, my understanding is, got pushed out. And, uh, and so they didn't really have a, a home to play in. You know, now that uh, uh, Tillman uh, Fertitta's uh, part owner of the the Rockets. There's been a lot of stuff saying that he's interested in bringing an, an NHL team. They've got a stadium that at least initially could could run it, right? And uh, you know, you just got to find it. So I I, be great. I think that there's a market. I think that there's an an appetite. Uh, I'd love to see an NHL 
Houston Arrows. For what it's worth, I, I come cool. from I, I come from Philadelphia, so the Flyers and Sixers they share a stadium, the Wells Fargo Center. So I mean, yeah. they de- Rockets and whoever an NHL team definitely could do it for sure. We could do it. It would be it would be fantastic. I would be uh I would be certainly looking at season tickets right. pretty uh pretty quick, and that would be that would be a lot of have you ever, a lot of uh. Have you been to the Maple Leaf Pub in downtown? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've been there. so so. When when I first moved to Houston, used to uh, live right there. Yeah, so it's, uh, it <laughs> is a fantastic spot to watch. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't give it away. Spot to watch hockey. Maybe I actually shouldn't give it away. I don't want people. Uh, that's the, that, it's the hockey community in Houston. All all knows about yeah, but, it. So uh, uh, you're, you're surrounded I, by all the Canucks. I always say I'm going to get into hockey, but they never do. Every say every year. Um, maybe maybe well, honestly, to be fair, though, watching the NHL playoffs is super fun. Someone like yeah. someone is very, very, very casual hockey watcher watching the NHL playoffs is certainly for me. I have a bias towards baseball, I like watching playoff baseball more. But I do think a sure. close second for me is like is is NHL playoffs, and it's just super fun to watch. I think. Um, yeah, so, yeah, they're uh, man. These these guys go to the wall. It's fan fantastic yeah. to to see the the, the playoff hockey. How do you feel like it? How do you feel about hockey generally? As like publicly, like do you is there because it's because it's like it's not as big as let's say obviously it's not as big as like football yeah. or basketball but the but the support for hockey within its own community is so large that huge do you like is is it almost better where it's like not as nationally recognized in a sense Ooh. or would you like it to be bigger than what it as, is as as an adult playing hockey now the coolest thing about hockey is that there is this this tremendous community like like you mentioned so people who grow up playing hockey you know there you play classically in beer league until until you can't walk anymore you know there's guys that are in their 60s 70s 80s still coming out to the the rink and and skating i think that that sort of support is fantastic I, i would love to see it grow though because one of the issues is you don't necessarily have the support infrastructure in a lot of places, especially where there are not NHL teams mm-hmm. to grow youth hockey. So Houston has a youth hockey program. It's moderately large, but it is nothing compared to Dallas, for example. And for the best athletes then in Houston, they're not coming in and they're not playing hockey, right? The best athletes in Houston are playing basketball and, and football, right. maybe baseball, right? Um, soccer too. And so this, this sort of the support infrastructure is just, just not there today and the the things like the usa hockey which is is sort of the governing body of of hockey in the u.s has done a tremendous job in their learn to play programs Mm -hmm. and uh it provides a lot of support you know sort of subsidized equipment because it it is an expensive sport to play right a top like a pro level set of skates today are a thousand dollars that's just insane right to try and think about getting into the sport um and so the the ability to sort of figure out how to subsidize and get youth in, I think will only yeah. help everything. And, and, you know, then you get these kids into this community that is, and will always be supportive through their in, entire life. Some of my best friends in, in closest friends in Houston, I know, I know from playing hockey. Right. 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 And it's been like this everywhere I've, I've been. So this is not unique, right? I grew up playing hockey in, in Illinois. I then moved to Iowa. I played hockey there, and some of my my good friends there were from the rink. Moved to Santa Barbara, and Santa Barbara at the time didn't have a rink, and I would I drove forty five minutes down to to Oxnard, um, or, or Ventura, Ventura Oxnard, just on the north side of L.A. Um, not a rough drive, right? Drive along uh, PCH, sure, uh, along the ocean every day. Not uh, <laughs> not terrible, um, but again, some of my good friends there came out of the rink, and so everywhere you go, you make your your friends at the rink, and so that sort of community to get kids into such a supportive environment early that they can grow, they can become good at hockey. It'll only benefit them across the board. And I think this is true largely of, of sport in, in youth sports right. in general. Yeah. I think, I think hockey is somewhat unique in that you, you can, and you do, there is such a large, you know, co- uh, cohort of adult players, right? The other sports, there's no, there's no adult football league. That would be insane. We would break our bones nonstop. <laughs> um, you know, maybe golf, right? Golf, you might have it going and, and you know, play an 18 
Um, yeah. And, and drinking a six pack of beer is, is something that you can do until you're 80 as well. I also feel like in Houston, like you have a, it's such a playing on the ice is such a drastic change to the Houston. Like we think of like, I think it would be like people would be kind of interested in that where it's like, cause you, you have the humidity yeah. here. It's, it's such a, like yeah. Houston does not scream hockey, but if, if the, if we if there were an ice rink within the, you know, in in the area, I think you would get a huge interest in that, and it would just provide something. You, different. you do so, so, yeah. So there there are there are rinks. There's rinks down in Sugarland, which is a southwest suburb. There's Memorial uh, City Mall ice rink. There's an ice rink in the Galleria Mall towards mm. the west side, and these things have open skate, and they are often packed. Yeah. So you you have it. You 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 really need. I mean, if they bring a team, the the community will. I think the 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 hockey community already in place will rally around it and i think you will see an exponential growth when people get in and they see just how how fantastic of a of a so, so sport it is it is hard to get into because it's it's fast there's a lot going on at the same time tracking the puck it's, you know this is this is these are historic problems for yeah. the american market but man if you go to a game people get hooked pretty quick right pretty yeah. quick I was I always love going to Flyers game. They stink now, but you know is what it. But they do, have, <laughs> but they do have the best mascot though. They do. I think the gritty. I think gritty actually is objectively the best mascot in American sports. I actually don't <laughs> think it's even in comparison. Um, but who you got in the NHL playoffs? Who do you think is going to come out of the West? Who do you think is going to come out on the East? And who do you think will raise the Stanley Cup? Oh boy! Uh... <laughs> Real quick, Maple so Leafs. The, the Maple Leafs finally the... made it out of the first round. So that's the, the, the made it out of the first the, round. The looking like they're not going to make it out of. <laughs> looking like they're not going to make it out of two though that's okay um man i uh i honestly don't i don't know i didn't think the that the the panthers would would run with it the way that they seem mm. uh carolina's looking pretty uh pretty exciting too who would i like to see uh probably i think it would be wild to see seattle in it and right they're looking they're looking pretty solid uh so let's just let's just go out on a out on a limb and let's just say Seattle and Florida, I, just because they'll have the far the furthest flight yeah. <laughs> to uh, to away games. Uh, let's get these guys let's get these guys some jet lag well, uh, incorporated in. I think it'd be great to see an expansion team go to the the. Uh, well, if, let's say an expansion team wins the Western Conference, then that would be a huge wake up call to like get more because like if an expansion team can do it, then you know why not start. Um, why not start an expansion yeah. team? But also, too, Florida has oddly great hockey. I mean, obviously the Panthers got good, and the Lightning have been good for a while too. So I don't know, you know. And yeah. Florida also does right. scream yeah. you as a the, hockey, yeah, hockey. That's state. right. That's right. And and what you see is some excellent youth hockey players coming out of out of these areas that traditionally yeah. would not have have been there, and it's it is entirely because of that support network that uh, NHL teams bring. So I think it would be a, a huge boost for the the Houston community yeah. broadly, not just the hockey community, but Houston youth sports in, in general. Right. I think. Well, Professor Bergash, I want to thank you so much for your time and yeah, of course. It, was, it was excellent talking to you today and um, and to hear about your research. Um, for the viewers, thank you again for another episode, and uh, I guess I'll, I'll see you on the next one. Fantastic.